أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we're going to begin season two of this podcast on sacred text messages and the idea behind this is we're living in the age of text messages and we tend to forget that we have our own messages from God sacred text messages a text is a word in arabic it's a nas and the nas is the quran and the sunnah are both called uh, nas nas al quran nas al hadith it has a technical meaning in usul al fiqh but it, it generally it, it means the text itself in in usul it means something else it it means something that has no other interpretation except one interpretation so one of the uh, text messages that we received from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found in surah at-tawbah which is the ninth chapter of the quran it's very fascinating that it's the only chapter in the entire quran of 114 surahs that does not begin bismillah rahman rahim it's a late surah and because it's a, it's a, it relates to the mushrikeen who had betrayed uh, the covenant that they had taken with the Prophet Sallallahu and so there, there's a level of austerity in its outset that made it inappropriate uh, to begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. One of the things about our religion is there's a secret in all of the names. So, for instance, when when it's 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 makru to say Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim when you sacrifice an animal. You say Bismillah Allahu Akbar because it's not rahma to sacrifice an animal to take its life. In fact, there's one of the Sahaba told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he'd never sacrificed an animal, and he said he asked him why, and he said I just can't bring myself to it, and he said that rahma. In your heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you. So he was recognizing that there are certain people that just do not have it in them to do things like killing an animal. Uh, and, and those people, we, we call them today HSPs, hypersensitive persons. So that is a, a real phenomenon in the world, our hypersensitive people. There was another Sahabi, and some people have asked me about vegetarianism. Like, can a Muslim be a vegetarian? A Muslim cannot be a vegetarian out of devotion. So in other words, you can't forego meat as a religious practice like you would do in Hinduism, say, for instance, or Buddhism. Uh, but, for instance, I know a rabbi who no longer eats meat because of the unethical way that animals are treated. That would actually be permissible. If you, if, if you were doing it because you felt that the uh, industrial meat industry is so unethical that you said, I don't want to contribute to it. That's a perfectly valid reason to do it because you're not doing it as because of the meat. You're doing it because of the way the animals are being treated. And But there was one of the Sahaba who was called Abu uh, Amr Ab al That was his name, the one who refused meat. And the Prophet Aqarhu Ali, which means that a person... Uh, could literally get, not eat meat. There's some some people don't like meat. In fact, there's an Arabic word for people that like meat, which is qaram. Uh, qaram. Uh, in the in the Muatta, there's a hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, in which Omar ibn al Khattab anhu, was asked about. Um, he asked a man who he saw him buying meat every day, and he said, like every time uh, you you you're hungry for meat. You, you you just go out and buy it? Like he's shocked by this. And the man said, uh, inni qarim, you know, like I'm qarim. In other words, I'm uh, a, carni- a carnivore, you know, somebody that really likes meat. And there are people that do like meat in that way. But Omar ibn al-Khattab during his khilafah did not permit people to eat meat every day. Which is very interesting because one of the things, believe it or not, uh, meat diminishes the uh, the net worth of a of a country. So, for instance, one of the things that the World Bank does is it measures all the livestock in Muslim countries as a way of assessing their value, and that and and then the loans that they give them are partly determined by the amount of of livestock they have. So these are all very interesting things economically. In any case, the uh, the 
the the the idea in Islam of just uh, words is very important. So for that reason, Toba does not begin Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I digress a little bit, but I'm getting back to something in Surah Toba, which is Ma kana lil mushrikin an yamru masajid Allahi shahidin ala anfusihim bil kufri ulaika habtat a'maruhum. So it, it mentions that the mushrikeen, it, it is not appropriate for them to be caretakers of the masjid, maintainers of the masajid of Allah. There's a qira'a which uses the singular, masjid Allah. So it, it actually means the, the masjid al-haram. But in the other qira'at, which have it in plural, and inshallah I'm going to do uh, a podcast on the qira'at because I've noticed a lot of confusion about these things. It's very important to understand because there's some Christian uh, people who are trying to use this to undermine the Muslim belief and understanding that the Quran it has been preserved. But in any case, the, the one qira'a has singular, the other has plural, which is very important because in one qira'a it means specifically the masjid al-haram. But in the other qira'at, it's indicating any of the houses of God. So this is part of the miracle of these uh, different variants. Thinking, you know, shahidun ala anfusim bil kufri, because they themselves are, are admitting that they don't believe. They, they're saying we don't believe in Allah and His Messenger. Those are people whose all of their actions are in vain. In other words, they think they're doing good by maintaining the masjid, but because their intention is wrong, it's for false gods, they, they, their actions come to naught. And so that's very important because in order for a, a, an action to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to, have, it has to be based on sound understanding it, it has to be in accordance with the book and the sunnah, and it has to be solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it lacks any of those aspects, then it's, it's something that's not accepted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the mushrik in Arabic is somebody who associates with Allah. I read in a recent book uh, by, written by a Muslim who said, you know, the polytheists, today we have people that uh, are are not polytheists. They're they're called atheists. So they don't believe in any gods. But actually, that's a a, a false understanding. Uh, the the atheist is a complete mushrik because he's giving to nature the attributes that are gods alone, and so he's associating with God. He's saying nature did this, or he's saying this came out of nothing. So nothing is is he's attributing this to nothing. So that is shirk because he's giving what is due to Allah alone to other than Allah. So this idea somehow that these people aren't polytheists is a total misunderstanding of what polytheism, shirk. Even polytheism is not the best. They're really associators with God. In other words, they give attributes to other than God that are God's alone. And so that's not necessarily an idolater in, in the traditional sense of that word in English, a polytheist. So, because they, nature might be the only thing they do it with, but it's still uh, a type of shirk. And so, the, these mushrikeen uh, who were priding themselves on taking care of the Masjid al Haram, which is the sanctuary in Mecca, uh, Allah is basically saying that they have no. Uh, no benefit. They're they're deriving no benefit from that. Well, wafinari uh, hum khadidun, and and this is uh, uh, something that should really terrify anybody who who has faith that they, they dwell eternally in in the in the fire. But then it says, Inna ma yamaru masajid Allahi man man aman billahi wal yom al akhiri. وَأَقَامَ الصَّرَاةَ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةَ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعَسَىٰ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُ مِنَ الْمُهْتَدِينَ Then it says, إِنَّمَا, which in Arabic is called آلَةُ الْحَصْرِ which is a type of, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a particle that 
basically delimits whatever follows. It's saying that only. So, so it's, it's uh, and then there's haqiqi and idafi. I mean, you get into different types of uh, inma. Inma ana bashirun. I mean, that's uh, idafi. It's not haqiqi. Anyway, these are, these are things that uh, people that study grammar already know. And the people that don't, you'd have to study grammar for, to really get into these things. But the, it, 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 it's uh, it's used for that purpose. So, إِنَّمَا يَعْمَرُ مَسَاجِدُ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ Those who believe in Allah وَالْيَوْمَ akhir And the last day. And obviously believing in Allah means believing in the messengers that Allah has sent us in our tradition. وَأَقَامَ الصَّرَاةَ وَآتَ زَكَاةَ And they establish prayer and they pay the zakat. So this is very important because the Quran always relates... Uh, the, the private with the social, which is very interesting. So you have private responsibilities, but then you have social responsibilities. Your private responsibility is to establish prayer, and that you do for yourself. But your social responsibility is to make sure that you're contributing to the well-being of society. So the common will, the contribution that you make towards the common will, is very important. And, and the beauty of our religion is don't fret over the fact that you're not taking care of everybody. Fret over the fact you're not taking care of one person uh, because Allah only tests us to our capacity, and so that's very important. And in that way, if everybody did what they were responsible for, you would have no, uh, n- none of the problems that we see, the social problems, but because people don't do that. And then you have these people that uh, want to create these fantastic uh, idealistic societies that will never be like the communists or or the socialists. These people that want to uh, to do things that are alien to human nature. Human nature is greedy, and 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 what Islam does is it alchemically transmutes that greed into a higher purpose. And so it's not that it gets rid of the greed, and that's why the, in the Quran Allah says, "Waman yuqashuha nafsihi," those who have been protected from the shuh of, the, of their self, the avarice of their, those people are the, the people who have success, the muflihun. They are the ones that have success. And, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said the best charity is the one who gives it being shahih. He's, he doesn't want to give it. So he's, he's giving it. And then Allah has put in these mechanisms in which they're actually greedy. So you're doing it for reward or to get some benefit in the akhirah. So it's taking your natural desires and transmuting them into otherworldly desires. But it's not changing that because that's the human nature. And even though there are a handful in the world of deeply altruistic people that will do things solely for the sake of doing it, that is not the norm and that's not how Allah created people. So Allah is... He speaks to us in accordance with our nature. He's not speaking to us uh, in ways that go against our nature. And Marxism is a completely false doctrine. And I would, I would recommend if you're interested, if you think there's any good Marxism, I would recommend reading Kurgan's book, uh, The Devil and Karl Marx, because it will give you, I think, a very interesting take on the occult nature uh, that uh, Marx was involved in, and also his paeans to the devil. Like he actually wrote poetry praising the devil. And uh, so whether he, he was serious or not, I mean, you know, people that don't like God love the devil. And, and, and e- even if they don't believe in the devil, they, they still just love the idea of the devil. And that's why somebody, like in the book uh, Rules for Radicals, uh, you'll, you'll find that he actually dedicated it to Lucifer, the first radical. And, and, and so artists love that. That's why in Hollywood you have all these people that do these rituals, uh, these uh, rituals from, from uh, the occult, because they love the idea of rebellion. And the devil's the ultimate rebellion. As Milton says on the tongue of the, the devil in his famous poem, you know, better to, uh, to rule in hell than to serve in paradise. You know, this is kind of the devil's idea. It's like, I'm not going to be a servant. I'm going to be a ruler. Um, so, and this is a horrible Arabic proverb that says, better to be the head of a rat than the tail of a lion. 
I personally would rather be the tail of a lion than a head of a rat, but <laughs> these are, these are uh, things that people can debate. Um, so, when, when, when Allah says, Khashya is a beautiful word in Arabic because khashya is always related to knowledge. So you cannot have, like, like you would not say, the dog is afraid of me. You would say, the, the dog is, is afraid of me. So khawf is different from khashya. Khashya in the Arabic language is always related to knowledge. And this is why Allah uses innama, we use that before adat or hasri, innama yakhsha Allah min ibadi al ulama. So the ulama are the only ones that have khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever level of knowledge they have. So the believer ha is a alim in that he knows la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and he believes in Allah and his deen. So in that way he knows that. He has that ilm. And so he can have that portion of khashya. But the more knowledge you gain, the greater the khashya. So the more you become a scholar, the more khashya you have. And then it says, فَعَسَى أُولَٰئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُ مِنَ الْمُحْتَلِينَ Well, one of the beauties uh, of this verse is that asa in Arabic, asa and la'alla are used quite a bit in the Qur'an. And normally they mean perhaps, maybe. The reason that Allah uses this here is because the mushrikeen were convinced and they boasted about their imara. Uh, and, and so they were convinced that they, they were benefited by this imara, where Allah is saying with certainty that they get nothing from it. Whereas it's telling the believers, perhaps. In other words, it's, it's really addressed to the mushrikeen to, to say, you're so certain about something that even the believers aren't certain about because they don't know if God accepts them or not. But Asa... Even though Asa here is, is strong, because if it's true, they're going to get it. So, فَعَسَ أُولَئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُحْتَدِينَ and, and this is the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. And so, this is uh, s some really beautiful verses about the importance of maintenance and the importance of, of maintaining devotional practice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, one of the things that we were looking at the other day was by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, where the, he said, when the intellect, when the intellect, uh, uh, all of the forms that the intellect's able to per perceive, uh, when, when the in, in, in its own uh, ability to uh, grasp forms in the intellect, when, when it saw its, how extraordinary the intellect is that it, that it can grasp all these things and understand them it's it's said and this is called lisan al hal in arabic which is is it doesn't mean literally said it but it's as if it's saying it lisan al hal it said ana al falak al mukawkab i am the planet around which everything revolves and then uh, sidi ahmad zarruq said but but spiritual practice al riyada said to it il zamni Cling to me and you will come to know your limits. You will know who you are. So our spiritual practice is why uh, it's so important to maintain that because through the imara, through this maintaining spiritual practice, especially in the houses of Allah, but if you don't now in the pandemic that we're um, going through right now, it's very important to have a place in your home uh, that is a kind of sacred space. I mean, hopefully the whole house is, is Darul Islam. You should always have a place in your home that you use for ibadah. And, uh, and you'll find, if you do this, that that will have a certain sakina, a, t a type of tranquility that other places in the house don't have. And, and that's just the nature of doing spiritual practice uh, in one place. And this is why when we go into... Uh, masajid, very often we immediately feel a type of sakina. We also find this in places like forests and because they're all in a state of tasbih and, and uh, they're, they're Allah's creation. So anyway, these are really, really uh, beautiful verses 
reminding us of the importance of taking care of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, I'll, I'll conclude with a, a really, I think, stunning hadith in which the, the, uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, uh, according to Jabir ibn Abdullah, it's related in Ibn Khuzayma in Ibn Majah, uh, it, but it, it also has iterations in Sahir Bukhari and Muslim, but this pers- particular one is in uh, Ibn Khuzayma in Ibn Majah, where the Prophet sallallahu was reported to have said, or something akin to, man bana uh, masjidan lillahi ka mafhasi qatatin, أو أصغر بن الله له بيتا في الجنة that whoever builds a house for the sake of Allah meaning a masjid a place of worship for the sake of Allah كمفحص قطات أو أصغر like the sand grouse's nest and there's a little Arabian bird called a قطة which which is a sand grouse in English it's a beautiful spotted speckled bird it's quite stunning to look at and it, its nest is actually in the sand. It's a very small nest, and it lays its eggs there. And the, these are uh, beautiful birds. They're monogamous birds. Uh, they mate for life, and they also um, they, they travel in large uh, numbers. So it's kind of it's interesting that he said that type of bird, which is, is, is a congregational bird. So he's talking about the masjid. So that little bird, they, they nest together. So you'll see all the nests in one place. So the fact that he used that as a metaphor is quite stunning because he was indicating like, even if you build a masjid just enough for one person to pray in, that Allah will build a house for you in Jannah. But it can also mean, and inshallah this is one of the means because the ulama say it's for mubalagha or hyperbole, that even if you contribute uh, just the 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 amount of a sand grouse's nest to building a masjid, Allah will build a house for you in paradise. And so uh, support your masjids, uh, maintain them, be people that uh, do this. It's very important. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with this new year. It's, uh, it's inshallah, we should always be hopeful about what's to come. The Prophet ﷺ was always hopeful. He was never somebody who despaired. And the Qur'an reminds us that uh, only the disbelieving folk despair of Allah's uh, grace, His rawah. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this. And I know this is a miladi year and we're, we're, we, we've, uh, we've already entered into our new year. But this is the, the year that we uh, mark our days by in the West. And so um, it, it, it is a new year in that way for all of us. Um, so may may it be a blessed one for all of you, inshallah. And uh, I know there's people that would say it's a bid'ah to say, um, like, have a good new year or something like that. But generally, these things, if they're not related to ibadah, uh, even though people would say, oh, well, it's Christian uh, New Year. But it's also called the common era. So it's not just the Christians. I mean, the whole world now uses the common era, which is why it's called CE now and not B.C. or A, uh, A.D. Yeah, Anno Domino in the year of our Lord. So, and Isa alayhi salam is one of our sada. He's, he's a sayyid. So, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, inshallah, and protect you from the waba and bala, inshallah.